All right, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Carrie Ann Biondi, who's an associate professor at uh, Marymount Manhattan College in New York. Teaches a wide range of philosophy courses uh, and uh, publishes as well. I know her primarily as uh, co editor of Reason Papers, uh, which is a fine publication, many years long standing. And she's here to present the second part of a two part series on enemies of capitalism. All right, it's all yours. Uh, how many people were um, not present at the first? Okay. Uh, uh, and for those of you who were, I see some familiar faces from last time. I just want to let you know that the first few paragraphs of the two presentations are identical, uh, but thereafter the content is completely different. So if you, you're sitting here wondering, I think I've heard that already. You have. Uh, but that's okay. It won't last for more than a couple of minutes. One answer to the question, who is John Galt, is that he is an intellectual warrior. That is, someone who takes to the field in the battle for man's mind and the freedom we all need to actualize our mind's potential. Galt is a scientist and inventor, but he also studied history and philosophy, which is why he knew how to stop the motor of the world and go on strike against his oppressors. The making of an intellectual warrior, and we each can be one in our own way, in part requires us to know our enemies. In philosophy, who needs it, an address delivered to the graduates of West Point in 1974, Ayn Rand underscores this exact point. She says, the battle of philosophers is a battle for man's mind. If you do not understand their theories, you are vulnerable to the worst among them. And a battle of this kind requires special weapons. Only philosophy can provide you with the, these weapons. She further extends her martial analysis urging her audience at West Point to become intellectual warriors in addition to the ones they've already been training to become. In your own profession, in military science, you know the importance of keeping track of the enemy's weapons, strategy, and tactics, and of being prepared to counter them. The same is true in philosophy. You have to understand the enemy's ideas and be prepared to refute them. You have to know his basic arguments and be able to blast them. Objectivists take principled stands on issues that cause them to elude easy political characterization, at least in the American context where politics is cast in terms of right and left. So they're accustomed to being challenged from all directions. Among those challenges is the persistent rejection of capitalism, which creates a hostile climate for business and entrepreneurship in every domain from education to healthcare. Critiques of capitalism are often driven by ignorance, sometimes by malevolent ad hominem vilification. Especially popular tactics in either case involve what I call visual hijacking, which pervades the popular imagination through images of capitalism as grinding exploitation, alienation, mindless superficiality, narcissism, poverty, and gluttony. But we should expose these images for what they are, caricatures of capitalism. Although ultimately mistaken, some critiques are actually quite deep and thoughtful, and they need to be grappled with. They depict real and pervasive problems, but ones whose causes lie elsewhere than in capitalism's productive potential of free exchange with people of value. In order to be able to set the terms for and win back discussions of capitalism, it's crucial to understand the premises of these critics. This requires careful study of the works of those with whom we disagree, as well as courageous debate with those who hold such ideas. John Stuart Mill's On Liberty really gets to the essence of how it benefits us to read those with whom we disagree. There are two valuable things at the very least. First, we're able to reflect on and meet the challenges they offer when we know them. More importantly, we come to understand better the meaning of and rational grounds for the beliefs that we hold, so that we hold them independently as living truths rather than second-handedly as dead dogmas of words uttered meaninglessly that we don't know what we're talking about. So in this second lecture of a two-part series, I'm going to be focusing on just one of the three major crit critiques of capitalism, which I think is also the most pervasive and commonly em embraced. John Rawls' welfare liberalism. So I'm going to, after explaining his view, articulate how objectivism rejects welfare liberalism and defends capitalism as the best hope for human flourishing. 
So just like I did last time, I've got some pictures for you. So let's take a look at the visual hijacking used by those who support welfare liberalism. The idea here is that capitalism both leads to and cannot guarantee the non-existence of phenomena such as these. Starving children reduced to eating crumbs from a filthy floor. Unsanitary and dangerous shantytown dwellings and homelessness. The implicit judgment is that if you support capitalism, then you cold-heartedly create and support the conditions of all this. Let's unpack welfare liberalism's concerns, as most famously defended by Rawls in his seminal 1971 work, A Theory of Justice. I cannot overstate the influence that Rawls has had on the academy. He is the darling of a vast bulk of the higher education establishment. And it's not an exaggeration to say that Rawls studies is a cottage industry with 95%, and that's a conservative estimate, of faculty in the academy supporting and teaching his views as though they are true, without question. Robert Nozick's 1974 Anarchy State and Utopia was written directly by Nozick as a challenge to Rawls' the theory of justice, which just came out three years before they were colleagues at Harvard down the hall from one another. But he is seen in the academy as a fringe critique of Rawls. You can only imagine how Rand's critique is received, or more commonly, ignored. Speaking of Rand's critique, before proceeding, I want to note that the best I can discern, Rand did not read this book herself. She states in a 1973 untitled letter in Philosophy Who Needs It that she relied on what she took to be an accurate summary of a theory of justice in a New York Times book review. She then proceeds to launch an 11-page attack on his theory. To her credit, she does ask us to consider this a review of a review. I don't think that's a good idea. Uh, I don't advocate basing your critique of someone's view on indirect or second-handed apprehension of his view. So Rand should have read Rawls's book if she planned to critique his theory so that she was working with a direct experience of the source material and could be assured that she understood what Rawls actually said. So it's not clear that a review of a review is worth a whole lot. Okay, on to uh, the uh, critique from Rawls. One of the major complaints that welfare liberals have of capitalism is that it neglects the needy leaving them to wallow in significantly suboptimal conditions or even to die. Those who cannot afford the goods and services produced under a capitalist system are simply left in the dust. This violates what Rawls calls justice's fairness. Now to aid you in uh, working through the very brief outline that you have in your uh, binders, I have a list of most of the technical terms from Rawls as a theory of justice. And at the bottom you'll see an illustration that will help me talk through the maximum and decision rule procedure. So this is meant to accompany the outline that you already have. Rawls regards fairness as what all free and rational persons concerned to further their own interests would accept in an initial position of equality. I'm going to say more about the specifics of this and what it requires in section 2C. Now since no one would want to be needy, poor, ill, or dead, then any system that allows people to fall into such conditions is unfair. The free market system of capitalism permits this and hence is unfair. That's the essence of the uh, justice's fairness uh, case. I should note that welfare liberalism, unlike communism, does not require radical equality of outcome. That is, it does not require egalitarianism. In fact, in the academy, the most vocal and tolerated critique of Rawls has been from the communist left, complaining that Rawls is not egalitarian enough. Welfare liberals tolerate and even encourage, in Rand's words by the mechanism of the sanction of the victim, economic inequality so long as the disadvantaged don't slip through the cracks. Rawls refers to the disadvantaged as the least well off, and it is the benefit of this group that especially justifies the existence of economic disparity. I say especially because Rawls thinks that all people should and do benefit from welfare liberalism, but he's most concerned that those on the lower economic margin are not neglected by the social contract. 
The tolerance of a gap between the wealthy and the least well off thus comes at the expense of the productive. The producers are impressed into service via whatever amount of taxation is optimal for keeping them relatively productive so as to create the safety net for those who need it. Welfare liberals call this process of scooping up some of the productive surplus from those who produce more and using taxation to give it to the needy distributive justice. Some people call it social justice. That's probably the, the phrase you're more familiar with. Why do the needy require a scheme of distributive justice, thus saddling a political society with welfare liberalism? Rawls' answer comes in two parts. The first is a metaphysical and moral one concerning dessert. And the second reason is, is grounded in rational choice theory. The first reason. According to Rawls, individuals do not deserve their natural and social assets. People are born with certain faculties, intelligence, physical fitness. They're born into a certain family at a certain time in history, in a certain society, and so on. None of these things was up to the individual. So it's a matter of moral luck that someone has a certain um, starting point that seems arbitrary from a moral point of view, that differs from others equally arbitrary starting points. Rawls even regards the effort that someone might put forth as influenced by his natural abilities and skills and the alternatives that happen to be open to him. Since those influences are not up to the individual, then effort cannot really be seen as deserving of praise or rewarded with the goods that result from such effort. What individuals get as a result of these starting points, whether the luck was good in that, say, someone was born into a wealthy family that provides him with love and a great prep school education and he inherits the family business. Or the luck was bad in that, say, someone's born into a poor family and he received a mediocre public education and now makes blizzards at Dairy Queen. All of that's entirely undeserved in either case. Being undeserved, any economic disparities between these two kinds of individuals is unfairly attained and so would need to be rectified via distributive justice. Things cannot be left as they are, either luckily prospering or unluckily struggling as they would be under capitalism. What these metaphysical and moral premises require, according to Rawls, is for us to view individuals' natural talents and social advantages as common assets. Being undeserved, such assets do not belong to those who ended up with them. They belong instead to the society under which those assets were made possible. These assets should be redistributed in what we would call a mixed political economy to what Rawls calls the difference principle. The difference principle holds that social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they are both to the greatest benefit of the least advantaged and attached to offices and positions open to all under conditions of fair equality of opportunity. There's that word fairness slipping in again and we already know what Rawls means by that. The difference principle is the second of Rawls' two principles of justice. The other is the liberty principle, which Rawls regards as having priority over, but doesn't think is in conflict with the difference principle. The liberty principle holds that each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive basic liberty compatible with a similar liberty for others. But here's his list of what those equal rights uh, are comprised of that must be guaranteed. Political liberty, such as the liberty to vote and hold office, liberty of conscience and freedom of thought, freedom of the person along with the right to hold property, that is if it's given to you or you're permitted to hold on to it by the state, and freedom from arbitrary arrest and seizure. Rawls argues that these two principles of justice secure what he calls social primary goods. These goods are those things that every rational man is presumed to want. They have a use, whatever a person's rational plan of life happens to be. These social primary goods include liberty, rights, opportunity, income, wealth, and self-respect. These two principles of justice, according to Rawls, would be chosen hypothetically by any free and rational person to govern the basic structure of a fair political society that looked to the mutual advantage of all of its citizens. At least, he explains, they would be chosen by any rational agent who was in what he calls the original position under what he calls a veil of ignorance. The original position is a hypothetical, 
pre-political situation that we, a la social contract theory, are asked to imagine ourselves in. We're to be guided by our basic sense of justice as fairness in selecting the general system of rules that should guide the basic structure of our society. The content of this sense of justice as fairness is attained by consulting a combination of what he calls our intuitive moral judgments and our provisionally fixed moral principles in a process known as reflective equilibrium. Through this process, we reach a mutually supporting and coherent set of moral beliefs by which we guide our actions and form our practices, including the two principles of justice. Now, in order to make sure that this hypothetical situation is imagined fairly, we're supposed to be constrained in our reasoning by imagining what we would choose under a veil of ignorance. Knowing what this veil is about is really crucial. Roll specifies that among the essential features of this situation is that no one knows his place in society, his class position, or social status, nor does anyone know his fortune in the distribution of natural assets and abilities, his intelligence, strength, and the like. Uh, he says, I'll even assume the parties don't know their conceptions of the good or their special psychological propensities. Choosing principles of justice under such imagined conditions is supposed to make sure that no one's advantaged or disadvantaged by the natural chance or contingency of social circumstances, which, recall, are not deserved and should not be allowed to skew what people end up with. Central to understanding why Rawls thinks that all rational agents would choose as beneficial both the liberty principle and the difference principle is the rational choice decision procedure known as Maximin. This decision procedure is devised for conditions of uncertainty, the veil of ignorance. You're supposed to be uncertain about where you're going to end up because you don't know who you are. And this means, uh, the maximum decision procedure means that when you're in this original position under the veil of ignorance, it means to maximize the minimum. The maximum rule tells us to rank alternatives by their worst possible outcomes and we're to adopt the alternative, the worst outcome of which is superior to the worst outcomes of the others. Now look at the chart on the bottom of that, uh, the second handout that you've got. So there are different circumstances that you could be in, and he has three possible scenarios, C1, C2, C3. And if you look under it, uh, you could end up with negative seven, negative eight, or negative five, according to decision procedure or, uh, 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 or principle of justice, D1, D2, D3. And if you uh, look, Maximin is going to require that we choose decision three. That should be the principles of justice because if you look at, uh, and you're like, well, wait a second, 12 and 14 look like pretty high numbers. <laughs> Why aren't we gravitating toward D1 and D2? Uh, well, although those possibilities for obtaining goods are far higher under D1 or D2, the lowest possible outcomes under the circumstances are such that no rational person would risk them. You see, D3 maximizes the minimum one might yield in the natural and social lottery. Because at the very least, you're guaranteed five. You're avoiding the worst outcomes of negative seven and negative eight, which on his view would really suck. So you're going to go to the least sucky situation that can be guaranteed to you. So you'll never get more than eight, but you'll never fall, fall below five. So one might not win much, but one won't lack for anything. That's the situation of welfare, welfare liberalism is safety net, which Rawls regards as the solution to the problem of social justice. Those are his words. So how do you respond to all of this? That's Rawls in a nutshell, so it's a, a very essentialized summary. Well, it's almost overwhelming as to where one should begin in terms of responding to uh, the welfare liberalism's uh, critique of capitalism. There's not enough time to enumerate all the problems with Rawls's theory. It, it is, as I mentioned, a cottage industry. Lots of people have uh, addressed uh, and raised uh, criticisms and gone back and forth. Uh, nor is there time to provide a full account of why capitalism doesn't fall prey to the problems it's accused of having here. But what I'll do is identify and explain a few of what I think are the most essential problems with uh, Rawls's welfare liberalism, and then sketch uh, in outline form a few reasons why capitalism, properly understood, is not only not the cause of the problems attributed to it, but instead is the best hope that the least advantaged have of serving their rational self-interest contrary to what Rawls maintains. 
Now, one difficulty endemic to welfare liberalism is what's known as the moral hazard problem. This kind of hazard is created by the sheer existence of a safety net, which incentivizes using a safety net. Why work so hard to avoid being poor when someone else can provide the basic goods and services for you? It's true that they're relatively minimal goods and services, so you're not going to become fabulously wealthy, have lots of stuff where, for those of you who were here last time, you're not going to be able to buy your dog $5,000 diamond necklaces like Paris Hilton does. Uh, you're not going to have all that stuff. You're not going to be able to undergo elective surgeries to you know, do all kinds of enhancements. But some people, perhaps lots of people, might be content with those basics and hence will uh, use that system more than they would otherwise, at least more under welfare liberalism than they would fall into under capitalism. So the costs of taking care of the needy under welfare liberalism are thus higher and probably substantially higher for at least two reasons. First, moral hazard creates a larger than otherwise number of allegedly needy people through the moral hazard incentive. Second, there's the added expense by the administrative state's third party payer system of the safety nets, goods and services. So at least on efficiency grounds, that's not optimal. On self-respect grounds, which remember is one of the uh, primary social goods that Rawls thinks that welfare liberalism provides. I think one should be wary of contriving a system that makes it enticing not to try too hard, not to be ambitious to achieve one's best, especially when that comes at the expense of those who do work really hard. So I find this difficult to square with Rawls seeing uh, uh, one of the uh, social primary goods as being the basis of self-respect when such a system can significantly undermine the psychological conditions needed to be efficacious. But far more pernicious are Rawls's views on the natural and social lottery and the issue of desert and moral luck. Now, if something's truly outside of someone's control, then of course you shouldn't be praised or blamed for it for not being able to do what you can't do otherwise. Rawls has it so that there seems to be no room for free will. Free will, though, is what makes moral judgment and responsibility possible to begin with. Even in the domain of exerting effort, Rawls thinks that that's infected by the contingencies of life outside of our control. Until it comes to the highly abstract hypothetical rational choice construct of what to choose under the veil of ignorance in the original position. Suddenly, we're held morally accountable for that choice, and we can judge welfare liberalism and those who support it as good and just, and the capitalist free enterprise people who don't choose it as bad and unjust. So two problems emerge here. First, Rawls is inconsistent about whether and when we can be seen as exercising free will and whether and when we can be morally judged and held accountable. He cannot be allowed to have his metaphysical and moral cake and eat it too when it suits him to do so, when it arbitrarily fits his sense of justice. Second, his view of human nature and how it relates to the natural and social lottery is false. Now, central to objectivism is Rand's view that man is a being of volitional consciousness. This, of course, does not mean we can do anything we wish since we can't violate the laws of nature. Sure, we can try, but then you'll suffer the consequences of trying to fly in the face of reality. Most fundamentally, we have the choice to think, to focus our attention on the world, to figure out what's good for us and hence how to choose in such ways that serve our rational self-interest or suffer the consequences of choosing poorly. This nature, marked by free will, does not change on account of being born into circumstances beyond our control. Our parents, our genetic makeup, the country we are born into, etc., are not up to us. Rawls has that much right, but that's about it. The individual's effort, beginning with the effort to think, to focus, that Rawls notes only to shove to the side is precisely where free will is most powerful and decisive. A person might inherit a massive fortune in a loving family and through a series of evasions and bad choices end up homeless or worse. Or a person might grow up in the slums of Chicago in a violent household and through careful reasoning, hard work and virtuous choices end up becoming a philosophy professor. It is neither fair nor unfair that one is born into any given set of circumstances, and I'm inclined to think that we create much of our own luck. It also doesn't follow from the natural and social lottery that we don't own our individual selves and that which we create in the world by means of our choice to think. 
If we don't own ourselves, why would society suddenly do so? To make either one of those assumptions, that we don't have a right to our lives and that which is produced by our own effort, is to assume what Rand in what is capitalism calls the tribal premise. I'll speak a little bit more about this uh, in a few minutes. Next on the chopping block, Rawls' reflective equilibrium. Recall that this is the procedure of moral reasoning that grounds a moral theory, including Rawls' sense of justice as fairness. This procedure, though, is what Rand refers to in the objectivist ethics as a subjectivist social standard of ethics. And as such, it has no independent rational grounding. It's what's known in epistemology as a coherentist epistemology, where a set of moral beliefs passes muster so long as the intuitions and principles achieve uh, coherence and mutual support. Now, this leaves a given moral theory afloat on the society or culture from which it emerges. This is the epistemology of a sophisticated Peter Keating, who looks to a combination of his own strongest whims and to those around him to see what he should morally believe. Contrast this with objectivism's foundationalist epistemology, anchored in reality and apprehended through empirical experience and a rigorous process of reason. Now I'll begin my outline of the objectivist defense against welfare liberalism by addressing directly the issue of most concern to that critic, disparities in socioeconomic status and the poverty that exists at the lower end of this spectrum. The Occupy Wall Street movement has been one of the more recent public manifestations of Rawls's welfare liberalism. Their slogan, we are the 99%, caught like wildfire. Now while I agree that any ill-gotten gains, including those that contributed to the financial crisis triggered in uh, 2008, are unjust. They're unjust whether gained by the 1% or the 99% though. And I think the 99% bear their share of the burden in making poor choices here. The occupiers, though, arouse strong feelings of resentment and envy against those who are too wealthy. They revealed a sense of entitlement to the 1%'s surplus income. They held, as do welfare liberalists, that there should be a cap on what people can be keeping of their earnings, with the remainder redistributed to the 99%. And uh, another recent manifestation has to do with people really scrutinizing the salaries of presidents of colleges and universities, including my own at Marymount Manhattan College. Judson Shaver actually apparently is one of the 10 top well-paid college uh, presidents in the entire country. And some of the faculty at Marymount Manhattan College uh, raised a huge fuss about this and I've been trying to call him to relinquish his surplus salary and redistribute it to the adjunct faculty at my college. Still alive and kicking that Occupy movement which happened just a few blocks south of where I work. So one question to ask here is, so what if there's significant inequality? As long as individuals are not kept down by discriminatory laws, then what exactly is the problem supposed to be? Assuming either radical egalitarianism outcome or, if inequality is tolerated, that there should be a cap on what people should be allowed to keep assumes that tribal premise I mentioned above. Objectivism rejects this tribal premise root and branch. At the foundation of Rand's rational ethical egoism is the choice to live, which then requires that one chooses to use one's rational faculty to figure out how to do that properly in relation to one's nature. And it is one's own life that's the proper object of ethics. One is the ultimate beneficiary and should be of one's actions. Although others might benefit from your self-interested choices and you might choose to interact with others uh, because they contribute to the constitutive value of your own life. Rand's view of human nature provides a deep grounding for liberty and individual rights. It makes sense out of the values we hold, those are things that are most at stake and the virtues required to achieve them, including the virtue of productiveness. Since we're not merely Kantian disembodied minds, like Rawls's original position under the veil of ignorance imagines us to be, but we're embodied rational beings with physical and psychological needs. We need to function in the world based on carefully acquired knowledge that is both objective and agent relative. Thus, productiveness is a virtue in service to our lifespan, rational self-interest. It is in virtue of this that Rand's theory is able morally to justify capitalism. 
The basic individual right is the right to life, and the right to property is its only implementation, she says. Being free from force and fraud allows one to use the knowledge acquired through the rational use of one's mind. In this way, it becomes open to us to make the effort to obtain the material and spiritual values in the world that we need in order to flourish. Another question to ask Rawlsian welfare liberals, who are the poor or the needy? There exists a myth of socioeconomic stasis that needs to be countered by the reality of socioeconomic mobility. I've seen a few studies done on this very issue. I know that Will Thomas, for example, and many others have a bunch of statistics about exactly uh, this, explaining who falls into the different economic brackets, how frequently they move in and out of them, and why they do so, the causal mechanism of mobility. Now, many of those who fall into the lowest bracket are college students, those who've temporarily lost their jobs and went bankrupt, and dependent children in poor single-parent households. And many of these individuals will rise above their current circumstances at a not uh, you know, too long of a period of time, with the exception of very young children. Through the circ they will rise above their current circumstances through education and employment and initiative. I should know, I was one of those children born into adverse circumstances from a teenage mother who was still in high school. And yet here I stand. It's not that real poverty doesn't exist though. It does, and I don't mean to wave a magic wand to make it disappear. Objectivists cannot dismiss poverty so easily by saying that those who are chronically poor or needy are in such straits on account of their being lazy, feeling entitled to be taken care of by others, and wanting to be buffered from suffering the consequences of their own poor choices. Yes, such individuals do exist. I know some of them. And they do not have a claim against society at large or the 1% in particular. The kind of poverty I'm referring to, and that is indicted in the images that I already handed out to you earlier, is the real, grinding, persistent poverty, not the kind that's explained by personal vice or that is temporary. So yet another question to ask then, what are the causes of that kind of poverty? Contrary to what welfare liberals and their fellow travelers maintain, such vicious cycles of poverty are not caused by capitalist free enterprise. The most common causes involve deeply unjust institutional conditions that are socially entrenched through ignorance and oppression and legally protected by thuggish force. The latter include laws that discriminate on the basis of factors such as race, religion, and gender. Think of apartheid South Africa. Outright slavery. Uh, the Republic of Niger finally outlawed slavery legally in 2005. They were one of the last states in the world to do so and totalitarianism that prohibits exit and restricts or disallows socioeconomic mobility. All of these causes of poverty leave individuals living under such systems vulnerable to other phenomena that exacerbate their poverty or entirely wipe them out. Such phenomena, including war, drought, and famine, are often precipitated by the very regimes that created the oppressive and impoverished conditions to begin with. No wonder so many people risk their lives trying to make it to the shores of countries freer than those in which they had the misfortune to be born. None of those causes of poverty is either due to, cap or, due to or compatible with capitalist free enterprise. Rand often makes statements about others' needs having no claim on an individual. For example, one such classic statement occurs in John Galt's speech. Do not cry that is our duty to serve you. We do not recognize such duty. Do not cry that you need us. We do not consider need a claim. Do not cry that you own us. You don't. Only in genuine emergency cir circumstances might one have moral reason to address desperate life or death need. But Rand argues in the ethics of emergencies, once an emergency is over, no one's obligated to save his fellows from poverty, ignorance, neurosis, or whatever other troubles they might have. However, in the objectivist ethics, the ethics of emergencies and elsewhere, Rand does defend the conception of value that morally requires valuers to promote the conditions necessary for the achievement of one's values, including a political and legal system that protects individual rights. But more than this, such value promotion includes exercising the virtue of benevolence toward others, not just toward one's friends and loved ones, but also toward strangers. Rand explains that 
What one should properly grant to strangers is generalized respect and goodwill in the name of the potential value he represents until and unless he forfeits it. A rational man does not forget that life is the source of all values as such, a common bond among human beings. Indeed, she argues, all living beings as opposed to inanimate objects. And she even discusses in some places where you can choose to assist a neighbor in, out of this benevolent spirit. Uh, perhaps uh, the, the view about reciprocity uh, is operating in the background in terms of looking at your rational long-term interests, the value of life being promoted by maintaining such practices uh, in the benevolent fashion. And as such, you would have moral reason to do so. Notice that this does not demand that benevolent assistance be provided legally through a politically mandated safety net. One can choose to act on the virtue of benevolence only under conditions of freedom out of grasping the value of life and acting with integrity to support it. But in order for people to have the means to be benevolent or generous, they need to be free to generate and amass resources that they can then choose to confer on whoever they deem fit to give it. This insight is at least as old as Aristotle's politics, where he raises this very point when criticizing Socrates' defense of communal property in the Republic, that it would preclude the exercise of one of the major virtues on his view, the virtue of generosity. More importantly, though, for our present purposes, objectivism offers the institutional alternative of capitalism that is the poor and needy's best hope for flourishing and securing himself against future need. The fundamental form of capitalism's hope for benefiting all, and not just the 1%, and not just in the term of material goods, has been developed by Rand in various works across our corpus. By protecting the ability of man to realize the efforts of his ultimate source of wealth, namely his creative mind, capitalism allows for the value of creation that makes products and jobs available for others to benefit from. This is why Rand claims that businessmen are the symbol of a free society, the symbol of America. But however essential is the entrepreneur's role in creating and sustaining a free enterprise network that's in everyone's rational self-interest, he couldn't do, so, do this effectively without the appropriate legal and political context in which to conduct business. One that respects the trader principle that operates on voluntarily exchanging value for value. For prohibiting force and fraud and protecting contracts makes it possible for individuals to trade securely. When this is not present, we heard from the powerful and moving account that Ladar Levison gave us last night what happens. Alternatives to the welfare state that can avoid or mitigate substantial numbers of poor and needy people are thus made possible under capitalism. Productivity rather than moral hazard is incentivized by not having a safety net. A greater range and number of employment opportunities are created through free enterprise. More resources are created and become available for philanthropic activity. And add to all of this the newer phenomenon of social business entrepreneurship by the likes of John Mackey of Whole Foods and Mohammed Yunus of Grameen Bank. And an immense productive power has been unleashed in the world. When distilling critiques of capitalism from any direction, a few persistent themes emerge. They claim capitalism dehumanizes, degrades, exploits. Capitalism's to blame for mindless consumption and thoughtless neglect. Capitalism is undignified and unjust. That's what happens when you let challengers define your terms for you. It's crucial to know your metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics in order to justify your economics, law, and politics. Ask yourself, what is the self? How do I know that? And what is good? Be clear in your own responses. Don't rely on me. Don't rely on Rand or anybody. You. Then ask the questions and reframe the debates over capitalism on your terms. And taking back the content of your concepts, you reclaim capitalism properly understood and properly defended on its only fitting foundation, a moral foundation. Thank you. Did Rawls ever respond to Nozick's anarchy state and utopia formally?
That's a good question. <laughs> I'm not sure I, I actually know the answer to that. Uh, you see, since they were colleagues, a lot of their subsequent discourse was informal in the hallways at Harvard University. Um, I, he, he addresses and recalibrates parts of his view in his later books, especially political liberalism, but I, I can't really answer your question directly. I'd have to go check, double check to see uh, when, where, and to what extent he actually takes up uh, Nozick's challenge uh, from Anarchy Saying Utopia. So um, I guess it's a long-winded way of saying I don't know. <laughs> but I don't know. OK. Promissory note. Uh, I think we can all agree that it was r wrong to critique a work without having read it on the part of Rand. I'm just wondering um, how you would assess her assessment of it. Was she anywhere near close to um, getting to the essence of what Rawls was presenting? Uh, well, since she, uh, how should I put this? To the extent that she was taking the summary in that New York, uh, re uh, uh, New York Review of Books, uh, review of Rawls, uh, she got the main essential points, but the, what she was relying on, I'm not sure if it was entirely accurate, because she, she gets some of what Rawls himself was talking about and didn't really get some of the other things. And I don't know if it's the fault of the person who wrote the book review or of Rand getting a little hysterical about welfare liberalism. Uh, but most of the, que the questions she raises and the cri critiques she uh, uses pushed back on uh, welfare liberalism more broadly, I think accurately uh, get at the heart of it, especially through the tribal premise, uh, pushing back on seeing uh, the productive as social surplus to be redistributed to the needy. So I think that she does, uh, for the most part, uh, get right uh, welfare liberalism and Rawls's version, uh, even if I would quibble about how our understanding of, for, say, for example, the original position and the veil of ignorance, her discussion of that isn't very good, but I don't know if it's the, I should blame her or the, the, uh, the person who wrote the book review. Hi. You, you named three people who are enemies of capitalism, Marx and McIntyre and Rawls. Sorry, I can't. I, Marx, McIntyre, and, and Rawls. Rawls. And I, I wanted to suggest maybe there are three other enemies of capitalism okay. that are elements of human nature rather than persons. Um, I would suggest the fear of competition, envy, and laziness as parts of human nature that objectivism kind of ignores. And so I was wondering if you would comment on that, because the, the best I can tell is Rand says, don't be lazy, <laughs> don't be envious, and don't fear competition. But is, is that an adequate answer? Ah, OK. I, I, was, okay, I have a, a couple of things to say uh, in response to your, your question. And I uh, thank you for bringing up three other enemies that were not related to names. I'll say a little bit about that. I, I didn't want uh, the uh, three critiques to necessarily be uh, just, you know, the, the, the particularized faces who, you know, Marx and Engels, Alistair McIntyre, and John Rawls. They thought were the most um, full-bodied versions of uh, very thoughtfully worked out uh, examples of those three broader views, communism, conservatism, and welfare liberalism. So, so as those three broad categories, I think they are three of the most substantial critiques of capitalism that are out there that we get battered by in, in, uh, uh, in the, both the academy and in the uh, popular press, especially welfare liberalism, which is why Rawls got his own session. Uh, because that's the one we have to wrangle with most because it's the, mo it's the most pervasive reality for us to face. Your suggestion about the other three enemies of capitalism as being um, rooted in human nature, um, I don't, see, this raises something really interesting I have to think really hard about. I'm not sure if it's human nature to fear competition, to be lazy or envious. A lot of people may fall into those categories, and um, that would require me to do a kind of psychological study of human nature that I'm not especially well trained in, but I would certainly love to think more about uh, in terms of that. But I think in terms of uh, the basic conception of human nature that Rand works with, that we're beings of volitional consciousness, and we don't have to be fearful of competition, although people might, for various reasons, become so, uh, or to what extent uh, uh, 
uh, Walter Donway gave a great presentation on temperament that, that people might be low or high reactive and how that might play into some of this, I don't know, laziness and envy. Uh, whether those are learned, I would, I would suggest that these are not so much uh, inbuilt into human nature that we have to combat necessarily, but we should look more to uh, the broader culture, especially the role of education and, um, and uh, the ways in which there were all kinds of panels on parenting and how to raise children and uh, Socratic seminars and like the pedagogy. The, I think this is where a lot of the discourse should happen in terms of uh, family uh, mechanisms of education where um, people might uh, inculcate uh, various kinds of habits a la Aristotle uh, to cultivate um, virtues and to, uh, to and I, I would say that in the objectivist ethics Rand gives a, a, a compelling outline of an argument for why it's actually good for us to um, not fear competition but welcome it as bring, bring out the best in us. Joel Wade gave a fantastic presentation on grit, courage, and resilience talking about exactly that, that we should embrace that, what I call the hero's journey of um, the quest to uh, be our best selves. Um, and that laziness is not a virtue and not something that is bolstering of self-esteem. And to be envious is so counterproductive. It's focusing on others instead of yourself. It's second-handed. It's not independent. So I think that these all are connected to the virtues and to education and the broader cultural issues. So, um, but, so you, then maybe that's a sketch for another lecture for next year. <laughs> so thank you for the suggestion. It's fabulous. Thank you. Marsha. Like yeah, go right ahead. I, Socratic I, fashion, turn over the mic. I was thinking about it more in terms of what are human tendencies. And you can relate those three, you, you might call those three vices to human tendencies that if they aren't directed to a productive source, turn into that kind of vice. For example, um, fear of competition can be related to uh, your self-image, whether you're living, are you, where are you on the social hierarchy? Because we have these, we have all these tendencies to be very social and uh, try to arrange, connect our self-image to where we are in the social hierarchy, right? And that has to be remolded if we're, we're living uh, as a rational being, that has to be remolded into, well, are we achieving? I guess to the extent that there, some people don't have those tendencies, I've never been really competitive and I, or envious, so I, it, it's not, so maybe there are, some people have the tendencies and, and people who educate and raise them need to look out for that? Well, Is that your suggestion? Gotcha, it okay. It varies from person to person. Okay, gotcha. And Uh, here it is. In the case of the new egalitarianism, an academic source does exist. It may not be the first book of that kind, but it is the one noticeably touted at present. It is a theory of justice by John Rawls, a professor of philosophy at Harvard University. And she talks about there was a New York Times book review, and that's what I'm referring to. I didn't read the book. It's a 608 page book. I'm not going to read it. <laughs> <laughs> so, a trial balloon. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, but if you're going to write an 11-page critique about Rawls's 
essential theory, just go right to the source. I just, it's like the Cliff Notes version, and duh, okay. Yeah, so I, I'm not sure if the, so, you, you so know, I don't remember, I can't find, I, I yeah. I know there was some theory that she wrote about, and I thought it was based on an article that she read about the theory, where she said this is a trial balloon for some really bad ideas that they're trying to get into the culture. And it, she, it's, it's about walls, and she's right. Okay, yeah, she, New, yeah, newspapers are not published by or for theoretical innovators. Journalists do not venture to propagate an outrageous theory unless they know that they can refer to some reputable source, uh, able, they hope, to explain the inexplicable and defend the indefensible. An enormous amount of unconscionable nonsense comes out of the academic world each year. Most of it is stillborn, but when echoes of a specific work begin to spurt in the popular press, they acquire significance as an advance warning as an indication of the fact that some group or groups has a practical interest in shooting these particular bubbles into the country's cultural arteries. That's her description of that. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's. Sure. Oh, yeah. That would make, explain why it's so right, widespread among college students, because that history is used so often. Ah, OK. It was something like 2 million copies sold. Yeah, I know that for, I've seen it uh, in the bookstores at any, uh, all the colleges I've taught at. Yeah, uh, yeah and uh, students walking around with copies of it. So uh, thank you for uh, pointing out that connection, because I hadn't actually read that book myself, so I didn't know firsthand that that may have contributed to that cultural tipping point of taking up that phrase. So thank you. Um, also, Howard Zinn's book is uh, a lot of times required reading in public high schools. So. Ah, OK. But, I, but I also, I know that in terms of like uh, the way in which the uh, Occupy movement emerged, a lot of academics were involved, and, uh, and people um, in government who are trying to place blame. Now, Rawls's book came out in 1971, and there are a lot of powerful academic figures who have worked on different presidential advisory committees since the early 1970s, who took a theory of justice as the Bible for how to restructure and develop the great society in the direction they wanted. So these um, individuals, um, were helping to foster the flames of the Occupy movement. So I could see that from multiple fronts, from the academic front, the political background of the people like Machiavelli's advisor to the, the prince, there are lots of them who were Rawlsians. Uh, and so uh, it's, uh, it's really in the air of the culture for decades. Uh, and I'm not surprised that these, there may be multiple points that contributed to it. Um, so the enemies of uh, capitalism would be um, Rawls, McIntyre, and then Marx and Engels. And I'm just wondering what the, uh, the relationship or the interaction is with the metaphysics and epistemology of uh, Rawls, uh, McIntyre, and Marx compared mm. to ours, which is objectivity in, in metaphysics and epistemology. Um, are the other three subjectivists or are they is it a different kind of metaphysics i'm just wondering if you the, when you said the other three uh, uh, i'm sorry other well what, uh, the other three uh enemies of capitalism rawls mcintyre and uh marx like the three kind of and what so your question about them was what's uh, essentially uh common about their metaphysics and epistemology that yeah yeah because like ours leads us to a rational conclusion mm -hmm. of the, and i politics. and i think in the presentation last time and then this time i didn't make that f frontal because i was dealing more with the larger ethics in relation to politics and economics issues but did bring to the surface uh, the metaphysics and epistemology, which I attacked very quickly, which would need their own lectures. But you're right, in terms of the metaphysics and epistemology, it's a social constructivism perspective. And in that sense, it's, um, uh, it's both the self, metaphysically, and um, the way in which uh, reality is broadly understood is going to be socially constructed uh, in communities uh, out of uh, a sense of how they're it's primacy of consciousness. 
if you want to think of it in Rand's terms and the terms that are used in philosophy or social constructivism. Uh, and, and that elides metaphysics and epistemology because what comes, um, what emerges is that the world either it's, it's just what we believe of it and make and can remake of it, uh, or it's unknowable in itself if you're really hardcore Kantian. And so the mind is actively constructing uh, uh, the way in which the world is represented to us, connecting back to Descartes' representationalism, which gets me into other terrain that would take me hours to unravel. <laughs> So, but yeah, I think you have a, a very good insight there to suggest about the commonality of the metaphysics and epistemology that's in direct clash with um, objectivist epistemology and metaphysics. So maybe I should uh, play that up more uh, precisely and uh, clearly next time. Thank you. Oh, I see one, somebody moseying. One last question if you have time. Uh, I think we have two in, and a half minutes. Yeah, so in my uh, recent travels, it's not the enemies of capitalism the problem, it's often the so-called defenders of capitalism. Oh, are you uh, BHL? What, am I what? The bleeding heart libertarians? Uh, no, and yeah, others, that could be sorry. Them, uh, <laughs> and, well, and as an example, um, you'll go to a, a lecture and they're pro-free market and they'll say, with rights come responsibilities. Oh, noblesse oblige, oh, yeah. No, but that's the sanction of the victim, just hijacking them from the back. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, here. are hard to win the debate against the other side when they're actually yes. debating, you know, if, yeah. if we can't define what. Yeah. No, that's a great point that sometimes defenders of capitalism are their own worst enemies, <laughs> but only until the extent, well, that's what, uh, that's what the final contradiction that both um, Hank Reardon and Dagny Taggart had to recognize, that they were ena enabling their destroyers. And when they could finally see that, they could be free and walk away. So that you're, that's a fantastic point that I should integrate. So thank you. Being your own worst enemy. Get out of your own way. <laughs> all right, thank you, Professor Bianca. Thank you, thank you all.